All right, so we're continuing exactly from where we left off in the Flobzilla video number five for the Quickie series, and we're going to be going ahead and randomly generating some flops and trying to defend it with this 15.1% calling range. So let's go. All right, so jack of hearts, ten of spades, four of spades. Very similar to the last board texture, where it's one we probably don't want to let our opponent bet with any two cards on the flop, because once again, you know, pocket twos just does not seem like it should be a c-bet here when we have so many hands with so much equity. And we're going to go ahead and try to defend wide enough again. So hopefully we won't get another disgusting turn card, but if it happens, it happens. So first of all, we have 100, and, or let's just write down the flop, jack of hearts, 10 of spades, 4 of spades. And then we have a 174 combos in the in our range, and we're going to multiply that by 70% because that's what we want to try to defend against a half pot size bet. So 122, should our opponent be able to probably be able to win two cards? The answer to that is already pretty much known to be a no. Okay, so value raising range. So once again, same deal. You can slow play some hands here, if not most of your hands, since it's a three bet pot, so your opponent doesn't get as amazing of implied odds as he might in a raised pot, because in a three bet pot, the stack sizes are small relative to the size of the pot. So I wouldn't value raise here very wide, but once again, a hand like Jack-10 suited does make some sense to raise. Since our opponent does have so many gut shots in the form of ace-queen and ace-king, and I'm not really going to like raising on the turn when the turn card comes a king or a queen or an ace, I might still do it, but I wouldn't love it. And then I'm also not going to love it on a spade or a nine. I think I actually would value raise a hand like Jack-10 suited here. Pocket tens, I think I'm still going to slow play. They're still an extremely strong hand. An ace-jack, you know, you could. this is a spot where you could raise ace-jack based on how wide your opponent is three-betting. But my guess is, in theory, it's probably not going to be quite strong enough to raise because the opponent is really going to have to get it in for the most part with only stronger hands like sort of over pairs and really good draws. So I don't think we're going to want to raise ace-king, or sorry, ace-jack, especially since our opponent can have hands like queen-king, which can just get it all in very effectively against ace-jack. So I think ace-jack's going to be a call, but once again, that's a hand where you are going to want to raise that against some opponents, even though most of the time, you're probably not going to want to. Likewise, if we did raise ace-jack here, and if we raised all of our combos, we'd have to be bluffing a ton of combos on this flop. So it really depends on your opponent. It's a spot where maybe you should, even in theory, only raise a few combos, but I would think for the most part, in theory, it's probably just going to be a call. So value raising range, jack 10 suited, which is two combos. And then flop bluff raising range is also going to run around two-ish combos to balance that out. We're going to want less bluffs since it's a three bet pot than if it were a raised pot because we have less of a stack size to work with. And there's just nothing wrong with, with using a really small raising range here. Even if we wanted to defend 122 combos, so we're only raising around 4% of the time, there's nothing wrong with that. This will still be a balanced range if we have two bluffs and two jack-10 suited. So nothing to worry about there. So now let's do the calling range. Top pair, 22.4%. So that's going to be, what was that, 39 combos minus our two combos of, sorry, let's do that. Top pair minus our two combos of jack-10 suited. So that's going to be 42 combos. Flop calling range, so top pair plus is going to equal 42 combos. So that's a lot right there. Um, let's check out middle pair. Middle pair gets us to 68, and we're probably going to want to defend all of these, so that's going to get us another 20, uh, 24 combos. Middle pair, 24. Okay, and then, so now we can see we already have 66 made hands, so that's over half of our calling range is made hands. That's pretty good. Um, this is a board where it's very dry, so there's not that many turn cards that don't get any draws there. It pretty much have to be a six or lower knot of spades. So if we're mostly defending the rest of our range with draws, which it looks like we will be, that's totally fine. Because even if our opponent were to go bet, bet, bet on blanks, if we only have to defend a third of our range on the flop, we're going to get to the river with just strong hands. So I'm liking the way this is looking. And as you can probably already tell, this is a flop that hits the cold caller quite well in three bet pots because we have so many jacks, ace jack, king jack, queen jack. All of those with the offsuit combos. So let's just go ahead and continue. So let's look at some draws. So flush draws, 17 combos. So once again, you know, you could raise maybe one of the flush draws as a value of as sort of a draw raise, but not that big a deal. So I'm just going to put them on the calling range. If you want to raise one, go right ahead. Um, what else do we got? Flush draws, 17. 
I'm going to go back to this now. Open and stray draws, that's a lot too. So open and stray draws is 24. We got a discount of the three flush draws, so open and stray draws is 21. Okay, and then let's look at gut shots, because we're going to have some pretty good gut shots. So let's see, ace-queen is going to be 15 combos. I don't think we're going to want to defend the 9-7 and the 8-7, though I'm not positive. Obviously, we would defend the flush draw combos, but I don't think we want to defend the non-flush draw combos. Queen-9 suited, that's an open in straight draw, sorry. King-9 suited, king-9 suited looks like it's going to be pretty close. It might be that we only defend the heart combos. I'm not sure yet, so I'm going to go ahead and give this a count and look. So between the 119 combos we're calling with, I just counted them, plus the two we're value raising, plus the two we're bluff raising. So actually, let's bluff raise the king nine suitor. Why not? We already have over one combo over, so pretty much exactly where we want for the desired combos defended. So you can see, and you should do this, when you're doing Flopzilla and you notice something like this, you notice, wow, was it easy for me to defend 70% of my range on this flop. Like, it was really, really easy, and we're still folding gut shots. We're not getting crazy aggro with any hands. You probably are going to notice when you're doing this, like, well, if I had a really easy time defending on this board texture, and if I'm not particularly a very spewy player, I'm not a particularly overly aggressive player, then you're going to realize it's a. this is probably a really awful board to see bet and to a lot of opponents unless they realize how hard this board hits their range and you know it so unless your opponent is going to really realize well he's see betting into me on this board and this board gives me so many draws and positions so valuable on this board unless your opponent's going to think like that you're probably not going to want to bluff recklessly on this board this is a board texture where if you're the three better i would personally i would really want a good gut shot to see bet here i don't see me see betting here with worse than a gut shot um even a hand like 8-7 of clubs is probably very, very thin. Whereas, obviously, if it's a much better gut shot, like if it's ace-king off with ace of spades, it's probably a very easy c-bet. But just really realize, when you are doing board textures like this, your goal is not to just see what is theoretically correct or as close to theoretically correct as I can make right now. You also should be thinking, hey, if I have a really easy time defending this board when I'm trying to play theoretically correct, my opponent, who's not trying to play theoretically correct and probably doesn't have as refined of a thought process as I do, He's probably just going to be defending way too wide, and I shouldn't be c-betting this board recklessly. So really think about, when you are doing theory, how you can use that information exploitatively as well, because that's probably even more important. So I just randomly generated a turn card, and it was the three of hearts. So it's actually going to play very similar to the last board texture I did. We're just getting quite difficult board textures. So the turn did bring the double flush. So this board texture wouldn't be as hard as the last one, which had like it was like 10, 9, 7 with two flushes or something exceptionally tricky. But here, it's going to play very similar to the last one. And I don't really want to repeat myself all over again and talk about how when we have ace-jack on the turn or when we have king-jack on the turn, it can make sense to call with it or it can make sense to jam. Likewise, likewise, when we have a draw, it can make sense to call or it can make sense to jam. It's very close and very hard to tell. I don't really want to just repeat all that all over again. So I'm going to go ahead and make the turn something a little bit more dry, like the three of clubs rather than the three of hearts. So then now we're going to experience a little bit more of the, you know, calling a wider range, whereas last time we were jamming very aggressively with a whole lot of draws. So let's go ahead and do that. So I don't believe the turn card actually reduced any combos in our range. So if we had 122 on the flop, we'll solve that many on the turn. So 122 times 68.5%, 122 times 68 point, sorry, 122 times... 68.5%, that gives us to 84 combos. So can our opponent probably bet any two cards? We're going to find out, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no, because if our opponent really was double-barreling with something very weak on the turn, that's probably going to be a problem because we can have so many strong hands on the turn once again. So value-raising range. So let's slow down and think about this for a moment. Now, on the flop, I didn't really like value-raising because it keeps... By calling, we get a very, very good price, so it forces our opponent to follow through very often. That's the same reason why if you flop quads in a raised pot, you're probably never raising it in position. It's counterintuitive, but calling actually gets more money in by the river than raising does. So you're probably used to that without having to thought about it much in raised pots, but it's still true in three bet pots. The difference is in three bet pots on the turn, since the pot's so big and we can, get, j sorry, we can jam draws 
like open ended straight draws, flush draws, even some gut shots with over cards. And we need folds so little, and we have equity that it doesn't. Our opponent's not really allowed to fold very much when we do jam the turn. So this is talked about in other series, but just keep that in mind that in, if this were a raise pot, I would want to be raising a super wide range here. I wouldn't be slow playing very many strong hands like sets. Whereas in a 3-bet pot, I did slow play them, and it can make sense to jam them on the turn now, since our opponent's still going to have to call very, very wide, so we can't recklessly jam all of our draws. Having said all that, we don't really have any hands in our range on the turn that are kind of strong and vulnerable, so they would want to go all in. So in other spots in 3-bet pots, especially if we're not on the button and we can have you know a higher ratio of like ace-king, ace-queen, stuff like that, that might want to jam the turn for value but not love giving additional cards, that can make a lot of sense. But here, the only hands that I really want to jam on the turn are going to be like pocket tens. So we could put that into a value jamming raise on the turn, but to be honest, Tens are just so incredibly strong, I would probably keep slow playing. So I am actually not going to value raise the turn here, even though I would be willing to do it had the turn card come something else. Like if the turn card comes in eight of clubs, I'm probably going to start jamming with hands like 10-8 in pocket tens. But since it was a little bit more dry than that, I'm probably going to slow play them all. So turn calling range, we're going to have to get 84 combos again, which I don't think should, would be exceptionally difficult here. So let's go ahead and look. Top pair. Um... Let's just do that again. So top pair is going to, once again, be 42 combos because we raised jack-9 suited. So top pair. We can actually just go ahead and look up here. It's not going to change much. Top pair equals 42. You know, middle pair equals... We might not want all of our middle pairs, so let's look at our draws first. Flush draw, open and straight draw. So let's add those in. Flush draw, 17. Open and straight draw, 21. This will actually get us something interesting to talk about in a second. And... So let's see how many hands are left. 42 plus 17, that gives us 59. 59 plus 21, that gives us 80. So then we would want something like middle pair, four combos. Pair, four. Okay, so let's pause for a moment here and think. So what seems like is happening on this turn is we can kind of see we're going to want to call with all of our strong draws. So that's going to be something like our flush draws and our open-ended straight draws that are like king-queen. We also know we're going to call with all of our top pair and better. So now, with the last maybe 10 remaining combos, it's kind of tricky to say, well, should our last 10 remaining combos that we want to defend, should those be middle pairs? Or should those be um, open-ended straight draws? That's hard to say. And in theory, what I would do is I would ask myself, like, is my range a little bit too weighted towards draws? Or is it a little bit too weighted towards made hands? And then I would sort of add what I needed to in the range to balance the range out. So, in practice, I'm just going to, you know, look at my opponent's stats and figure out if I think middle pair or if I think a draw is better against this specific opponent. But in theory, you know, we don't want all of our turn calling range to be draws, and we don't want all of our turn calling range to be air. Here, it looked like it was already relatively balanced. Our draws are very, very good. These draws are going to hit a lot of pairs, and not, they can't, I mean, this isn't just eight outs for king-queen. It also can hit a king or a queen, which is a very good, you know, river card, especially if our opponent checks. Um, flush draws, same sort of deal. So these are very, very good draws. So, you know, I don't think we're going to need to put too much more emphasis on adding a whole bunch of more middle pairs. But since we have 38 draws, which makes up a pretty substantial fraction of our 84 combos, I think something like four middle pairs, so something like, you know, the ace-10 suited, seems pretty reasonable to defend with. So just know that. So if you are wondering on the turn, you know, how do I know if it's better to call with a middle pair, or how do I know if it's better to call with a draw, and if the draw is sort of, you know, mediumish strength, not amazing, and the pair is sort of medium strength, mediumish strength and not amazing, just know, put in your range, which balances out your range, so that way, you know, you can take balanced lines on the river. So here, I did the middle pair, so that gave us 46, 63, 84, perfect. Okay. So before we randomly generate the river card, let's stop and think for a moment, how many hand combos will we have to defend to make our opponent indifferent to calling on the river? Okay, so if he's betting a half pot size bet on the river, we need to defend 66% of the time, and we have 84 hand combos. So that means we're going to want to defend around 55 hand combos when our opponent jams the river in order to give him, an, you know, in order to make him indifferent to bluffing on the river. So if we defend over 55 hand combos, in theory, he never bluff jams. If, he, if we defend under 55 hand combos, in theory, he can profitably jam any two cards. So, keep that in mind when you're making this turn range. Does this look like a range that can usually defend around 55 hand combos on the river? 
To me, it looks like the answer would be a yes. So while there's many river cards we can get, ranging from a three of hearts to an eight of spades to a nine of spades to a you know king of clubs, and all those different river cards are going to make us want to defend very different ranges, this looks like a reasonable range to use on the turn. So just because we get a river card that makes it very, very difficult for us to call enough hand combos, that doesn't mean we made a mistake on the turn. Just because we get a river card that looks like we want to call even more than 55 hand combos, that doesn't mean we made a mistake on the turn. Obviously, we can't predict the river card, and we're not always going to get a river card, which makes it very easy to defend around 55 hand combos. And if we don't defend exactly 55 hand combos on every river card, that doesn't mean we're making a mistake or we're being exploited. So just keep all that in mind as we go ahead and randomly generate it. Okay, nine of clubs. So that's a pretty interesting river card. So, river... Um, so our total combos on the river is going to be 84. The river's a nine of clubs, so let me just go ahead and make the template. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and plug in the nine of clubs. Desired combos defended, 84, 84 times, I don't think that river card reduced any combos, times 0.667 equals 56, as we already said. Um, can our opponent properly bet with any two cards? We'll look at that in a minute. So what do we want to call with on the river? Okay, so we're going to call with 10-10. We're going to call with King-Queen. That gets us to 19 combos right there. We're going to call with Jack-9 suited, which is 3. 10-9 suited, which is 3. What other sort of top pair of hands do we have? Top pair. Okay, so Ace-Jack, that's going to be 12. And Jack-10 suited. Oh, wait, we raised Jack-10 suited on the flop, sorry. All right, so King-Jack gives us 12. Queen-Jack gives us 12. So that might be too many. 36, 39, 42. Yeah, that is a little bit too many. So let's go ahead and see how many we should need to defend. So that's 19 plus 3 plus 3. That's 25. 37, 49, so that would be queen-jack would be some combos, so that would give us 56. And that makes a whole lot of sense in theory to on the river, like, only call with some of the hand combinations, like, call with some of your queen-jack that will keep your opponent indifferent to calling. So, let's wrap this up and talk about this for one last moment. So, on this river card here, it looks like when we're calling the river with two pair and better, which is going to be this range right here, our opponent's just going to be value betting worse hands pretty often when we have these hands. So around half of our river calling range is going to beat a lot of our opponent's value bets. These hands right here are pretty much bluff catchers. I do think Queen Jack looks a little bit too weak here. Like, even King Jack, I think I would be folding it in practice a lot to a lot of opponents. But I think that's for two reasons. The first being I don't think most people bluff enough in three bet pots, you know, barrel off here at one, two, and two, four, which is where I have most of my experience in the last year. And I also think, as I said, against really good, theoretically strong players, the button opening range is probably a little bit too wide, which is probably why us needing to call down here with Queen Jack seems probably a little bit too wide. If we had a button opening range of, you know, maybe 5% less with a 40% button opening range, then we probably would be able to get rid of these hand combos right here, and our range would look a little bit stronger um, with us calling down King Jack or better. So... These hands, as I said, they're pretty much going to be bluff catchers. Ace-Jack might be splitting once in a while, but these hands, for the most part, are going to be bluff catchers, which is fine. If our opponent's balancing his bluffs on the river, then us calling with these should break even. And these hands right here should be pretty profitable calls because we're sometimes beating our opponent's value bets. And if our opponent is betting the river with a balanced range and we beat some of his value bets, then our call on the river is, of course, going to be very profitable. So... That is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, as we did one hand relatively quickly. So you can even just see how if we make the, the turn card a three of clubs rather than bring the second flush draw, we become much more cally on the turn than we did in the last hand example. And then if we, you know, if we really think about it and just sort of design our river, or sorry, our turn calling range pretty well, where we make sure we're not too weighted towards made hands or too weighted towards draws, then we usually get to the river with ranges that seem very reasonable. So. I hope you enjoyed the video. Good luck at the tables. I'll see you soon. Bye. Want to see your hands in the quickie? Convert your hand to